Well, even the 33 trillion, which you mentioned, that's just the on balance sheet number. There's the off balance sheet numbers, which are gigantic. It's over 200 trillion. That's not a typo. That's the unfunded you know, liabilities, many, right? Yeah, they're huge off balance sheet liabilities in the U.S. I'm not happy telling you that. I'm a U.S. citizen and taxpayer too, and voter. But it's it's a it's a good time to be an old American. It's not a good time to be a young American because we have these huge obligations ahead of us. In the intricate dance of global economics, few voices resonate with the depth of experience and insight as that of Jim Rogers. Renowned investor and financial commentator, Rogers has a knack for dissecting complex economic phenomena into digestible insights. In this video, we delve into Rogers' recent analysis where he unpacks the dynamics shaping the gold market, inflation concerns, geopolitical tensions, and the enigma of the US dollar. Rogers kicks off by illuminating the gold market's response to the rampant money printing witnessed worldwide in recent years. He emphasizes how the gold price, often considered a barometer of economic uncertainty, reflects the looming specter of inflation. As governments continue to flood markets with liquidity, savvy investors are turning to tangible assets like gold and silver as hedges against potential devaluation of fiat currencies. Central banks, particularly in Asia, are ramping up their gold reserves, a testament to the prevailing sentiment regarding inflationary pressures. The conversation naturally segues into the broader economic landscape, where Rogers sheds light on the inverse relationship between bond prices and inflation expectations. With inflationary clouds gathering on the horizon, bond yields are on the rise, driven by concerns that central banks' monetary policies may fall short in taming inflationary forces. While some cling to the notion of us government bonds as safe havens, Rogers urges caution, citing the historical inevitability of inflation following extensive money printing. Turning his gaze towards commodities, Rogers offers insights into the resurgence of oil prices amid geopolitical tensions, particularly in regions like Ukraine and Russia, he highlights the correlation between conflict and oil prices, underscoring oil's role as a geopolitical barometer. Additionally, Rogers notes how agricultural commodities are also impacted by geopolitical unrest, amplifying concerns over supply disruptions and price volatility. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more expert insights and analysis. The gold market knows that there's been a gigantic amount of money printing all over the world in the last few years. The gold price knows that there's going to be more inflation before this is over. And so the gold price is doing what it always does at times like this. It's going up because a few people, a few peasants like me, who know that when there's a serious problem, you want to have some gold under the bed. You want to have some silver in the closet so that people are gathering in their gold, including central banks and central banks, especially in Asia, are buying a lot of gold. As I said, there are people who know that inflation is coming back and bonds are going down, yields are going up because people hope that interest will help save them, help them get through any hard times. There are many people who think that U.S. government bonds are perfectly safe and they don't have to worry and they will get paid for waiting. It's traditionally usually been true. Let's hope it's true again. But I'm not so sure it's stealthily. <laughs> you know it, everybody knows it. Uh, but just to put it in perspective, the all-time high on oil is 150 U.S. dollars a barrel. So it's still way down from its all-time high certainly been going up recently. And part of the thing that's going up, um, part of the thing that's happening is, as I said, we know inflation is coming back. We know that the prices of most things will be going higher and oil is a way to protect yourself. And of course, there is war in Ukraine and Russia, both of which produce oil and agriculture. And there's possibility of war in other places. Oil loves war. War is not good for anything except a few commodities, including oil. Interest rates are at a recent high, but historically, this is nothing. You know, I can remember when the Treasury bills, United States government Treasury bills, yielded over 20%. That's not a typo. 
That's not a typo, over 20%. I don't expect that to happen soon, but we have printed, we, the U.S. especially, but the world, including Japan and the rest of the world, have printed staggering amounts of money in the last few years. Maybe it's different this time, but historically, when you print huge amounts of money, you will eventually get inflation, higher prices. So I suspect that somebody knows, maybe it's the gold market, I don't know, somebody knows that inflation is coming back. Mr. Powell and the central bank say, don't worry, don't worry, we have things under control. Well, I have learned in my investment career not to pay much attention to central banks. You have to listen to them, but don't believe them. Don't believe they know what they're doing because rarely have central banks anywhere in the world known what they're doing. We've had a couple of good ones in U.S. history. There was one in India a few years ago. We've had a few in world history, but most of them are incompetent. That's why they work for the government. I mean, if you can't get a real job, you get a government job. I want to say again, stay with what you yourself know a lot about. Don't listen to people on TV or the internet. Maybe you can listen to Danny, but for the most part, just stay with what you know. If you go down to the bar on Saturday night and everybody's talking about blah, 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 do not pay attention. Do not listen. Just walk out of there and say, I don't know anything about that, so I'm not going to invest. Just stay with what you, it's the only way you're going to survive. I assure you, the only way people, investors survive is staying with what they know. Avoid hot tips. Hot tips will ruin you. Now, I know you don't want to hear it. I know nobody wants to hear it. Everybody wants me to give them a hot tip. Everybody says, yeah, well, just give me one hot tip. I know you're right. I know everything you say is correct, but just one hot tip. No, no, Danny, stay with what you know. I can tell you what I'm investing in, but it's useless for most investors. I want to tell you a story about a guy in Paris in 1938. He said, oh my gosh, the world's going to come to an end. I'm going to get out of here. He got out of his globe. He found a remote island in the South Pacific and moved. He left Europe because he knew it was going to end in disaster. The small island in the South Pacific he went to was called Guadalcanal, which you may know is the longest and bloodiest battle in the Pacific War <laughs> during that time. So he was a genius and it destroyed him. So, yeah, I can tell you lots of places to move. But remember the guy who saved himself by moving to Guadalcanal. Who knows? Uh, I wish I knew. I wish it were that simple. Drawing parallels with the tumultuous 1970s view, Rogers acknowledges similarities in terms of inflationary pressures and geopolitical uncertainties. However, he underscores the stark differences, such as the United States' transition from a creditor nation to the largest debtor nation in history. Rogers' sobering assessment of the US's ballooning debt obligations serves as a cautionary tale for future generations, hinting at the generational wealth transfer underway. Well, the 70s were certainly a period of big inflation uh, because of huge money printing. The, the Vietnamese War, etc. Uh, we printed huge amounts of money, the world did, and we paid the price in the 70s, as we always have. So I would suggest there are some similarities to the 70s. But remember, in the 1970s, the U.S. was still a creditor nation. Now we're the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. There was still communist Russia in the 70s. There was red China still in the 70s. So there are some big differences. There are always big differences and there are always similarities. A similarity is, has been huge amounts of money printing and put small wars right now that potentially could get worse, just like the 70s. Hmm. So... I am we, not suggesting this is the 70s by any stretch, because as I said, the U.S. is the largest debtor nation in world history now. And in the 70s, we were still a creditor nation, but there are some similarities. Well, even the 33 trillion, which you mentioned, is that's just the on balance sheet number. There's the off balance mm. sheet numbers, which are gigantic. It's over 200 trillion. That's not a typo. That's the unfunded you know, liabilities, many, right? Yeah, they're huge. 
off balance sheet liabilities in the U.S. I'm not happy telling you that. I'm a U.S. citizen and taxpayer too and voter, but it's it's a it's a good time to be an old American. It's not a good time to be a young American because we have these huge obligations ahead of us. Despite acknowledging the US dollar's inherent vulnerabilities as a fiat currency, Rogers maintains a pragmatic stance on its role as a safe haven during times of turmoil. He points to historical precedents where investors flocked to the dollar amidst uncertainty, driven by its perceived stability relative to other currencies. However, Rogers remains vigilant, recognizing the need to reassess his positions in light of changing market dynamics. Well, I own a lot of US dollars, not because it's a sound currency. I just told you we're the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. But throughout the last hundred years, when there's been turmoil, people have reached for a safe haven. That has been often the US dollar, which is one reason I own a lot of US dollars. I expect that to happen again. When we have serious turmoil, people are going to grab for the US dollar. It's going to go up. I hope that I'm smart enough to have to sell it if it has a panic rise. I hope I'm smart enough. I hope it happens, and I hope I'm smart enough to sell it. The question then, Danny, and I'm sure you have the answer is, where am I going to put my money? You know, I don't see any other currency. At one time, it would have been the Japanese yen. At one time, it would have been many things. But I don't see a currency now that has the capability of competing with the U.S. dollar. I mean, if you know what it is, please don't tell us. Send me an email because we're all looking for the new competitor to the U.S. dollar.